Parks and Recreation. How can I help you? Hello, my name's Wendy and I'm calling from the podcast Science Versus and I heard that you guys had a Bigfoot sighting. Uh-huh. Is that true? Um, let me transfer you to Roger. Hold on just a second, okay? Okay, thanks. You're welcome. I'm on the phone to Parks and Rec in Round Rock, Texas. It's a town about 20 minutes north of Austin. And in June, their official Parks and Rec Department Facebook page posted pictures of suspiciously large footprints and other rather odd findings. This is Roger Heaney, the Parks and Rec spokesperson. So who saw Bigfoot? Yeah, there's been several sightings of Bigfoot prints and Bigfoot fur and other unexplained phenomenon in our parks, trails, in and around our woods areas here in Round Rock, Texas. It's been pretty amazing. Bigfoot has been seen all over the United States, not just in Texas. A paper, yes, a scientific paper, published several years ago, analysed more than 500 Bigfoot reports across the Pacific Northwest since 1944. And people have taken these reports so seriously that a county in Washington has outlawed the, quote, premeditated, willful or wanton slaying of Sasquatch, end quote. That's a.k.a. Bigfoot. But it's this recent sighting in Texas that has been getting a lot of attention. This is one huge footprint found along the Brushy Creek Trail Father's Day weekend. More evidence keeps popping up. Curious clumps of evidence, maybe hair, perhaps from Bigfoot. So we had to send a reporter to examine the evidence. Whatever Wendy wants, Wendy gets. Rose Reed is a radio producer and friend of the show. And she went into the heartlands of Texas to get to the bottom of this. How did it go? Well, as any search for a big man goes. (laughs) (laughs) Elusive, intriguing, left with questions. Rose found out that this Big Bigfoot fervor kicked off when a resident said that they saw Bigfoot. Then, a couple of days later, a park ranger at Round Rock noticed something really unusual. Oh, this is Rod- famous Rodney. Hi, I'm Rose. How you doing, Rodney? And Rodney is a straight shooter, a by-the-book kind of guy. Yes, that is correct. So, a few months ago, on the morning in question, Rodney was just going about his regular business, making sure the park was in order. Is part of your job looking for unusual things? Yes, that is correct. If we hear or see anything, we definitely had to come and check it out to see if there's something that we need to report. And that morning, he did see something that he needed to report. When I was changing the trash can, I heard a lot of noise down here, and I saw this. Uh, basically, it's like a... Uh, a fort that's built with a whole bunch of sticks, and I thought it's going to be a Bigfoot nesting area. And then more evidence surfaced. Some giant footprints had been found. Rodney took Rose to see one. It was in some scrub near a creek. There's a footprint right here, so. It really actually looks like a footprint. It sure does. I'm a size eight in women's. This is about four inches taller than mine, you think? And wider. Much wider. When Rose was back in New York, she was still thinking about how real and big that footprint looked. That's what's so crazy about it. And wait, so, but were there footprints like around it? Just one solo footprint? Just one. That's weird, right? Because unless it's like a a peg leg Bigfoot. Or he was running through the creek bed. Or she was running through the creek bed. Touche. Okay. So could... Bigfoot have made those footprints? Is Bigfoot living amongst us? That's what we're going to find out here today. And you might think, Bigfoot doesn't exist. Knock it off, Wendy. But all around the world, people have stories of these kinds of creatures. In the Himalayas, it's called the Yeti. In Russia, they're called Almas. In Australia, it's the Yowie. But whatever you call it, and on today's show, we're going to call it Bigfoot, recent scientific discoveries have made the idea of this creature kind of plausible. When it comes to Bigfoot, there are lots of hairy things in the woods. But 
then there's science. Science versus Bigfoot is coming up just after the break. This episode of Science Versus is brought to you by Cole Hahn. Cole Hahn believes in highlighting the stories of smart and extraordinary people. And so I sat down with some people who I would definitely consider to be extraordinary. My fellow female hosts here at Gimlet. And we talked about something that we all deal with in different ways. Perfectionism. I feel better when I'm striving. I can't even remember a piece where I'm like, well, that was perfect. And right. that whole thing that there is no... There is no perfect. There is no perfect. Mm-mm. No, there is. <laughs> <laughs> Hear more of our conversation by sticking around after the credits of today's show or go to extraordinariesonthemic.com. That's extraordinariesonthemic.com, produced in partnership with Cole Hahn. Hey, it's Wendy, and I want to tell you about a new Gimlet podcast. It's called Uncivil. Uncivil is a show that will ransack the official version of the Civil War and take on the history that you grew up with. They'll bring you untold stories about covert operations, corruption, resistance, mutiny, counterfeiting, and so much more. And they'll connect these forgotten struggles to the political climate that we're living in right now. Uncivil is out now. Go listen and subscribe wherever you get your podcasts. Welcome back. Today, we're on the hunt for the fresh prints of Bigfoot. Because some scientists, they haven't ruled it out. Even the famous primatologist Jane Goodall has said that she's sure that they exist. And she's not the only scientist with questions. I'm simply arguing that hey, there is some really fascinating evidence that that we should probably take a look at. There are things out there that have not been discovered, and there always will be. Anyone who says, oh, no, there can't possibly be, is guilty of, of being unscientific. OK, so the first question we want to look at is, if Bigfoot does exist, what could it be? Well, a couple of ideas have emerged. One is that it's an ancient human-like ancestor that's still kicking around in some remote forest. You see, in the decades after Darwin, many scientists thought that the evolution of Homo sapiens, that's you and me, was a straight line from the chimps that left the trees to the pinnacle of human intellect that you see today. Anyway, you've probably seen those T-shirts from the knuckle-dragging monkeys to fully upright humans. Well, that's kind of how we thought that evolution worked. But then, scientists started picking up these weird human-like bones and teeth all over the world. In fact, in just the last few decades, we found odd human looking fossils in South Africa, Kenya, Indonesia, Portugal and Russia. So far, there's around half a dozen species on our ever bushier family tree. Fossils are continually added to that family tree so that now instead of a singular stem, we've got this bush with lots of branches. That's Jeff Meldrum, a professor of anthropology at Idaho State University. And Jeff says that not only did these discoveries change the way that scientists thought about our family tree, but for scientists like Jeff wondering... If maybe Bigfoot is real, these discoveries really changed the game because it gave a scientific explanation for Bigfoot. I mean, it's always been assumed that these branches of the family tree became extinct, but maybe they're still living out there somewhere. You know, the argument that, as was thrown in my face one time, they can't exist, therefore they don't exist, and I don't care what evidence you think you have. You know, real scientific attitude demonstrated there. But that's just absolutely inane and baseless in light of what we now know. Because we know that at least at some points in our long history, humans hung out with these human-like creatures. And we know this because they did more than just watch Netflix. They also chilled. Oh, yeah. And by that, I mean they had sex. 
Homo sapiens had sex with at least two other human-like creatures on the family tree, Neanderthals and another group called the Denisovans. That was perhaps some 30 or 40,000 years ago. And how do we know this? Because those odd couples had babies who had babies who had babies. And today, some of us have bits of their DNA in us. Remarkably, some people have up to 6% of their DNA from Denisovans. If you could jump in a time machine and go back 30,000 years to East Africa, you potentially would bump into different species living across the landscape, different species of hominin. And, and that's probably just scratch on the surface. See, that's the thing. And so, and you so to you, the fact that this tree is branching out and branching out and branching out, it, it gives more weight to this idea that a branch could lead to Bigfoot. Exactly. Also, the recognition that now we know many of these branches have persisted until remarkably recently. So, if we know that some of us were chilling together a cheeky 30,000 years ago, maybe we're all still hanging out. Okay, so that's one idea of what Bigfoot could be. That is, a creature related to Homo sapiens, but that's a little more Neanderthal than Gyllenhaal. But there is another possible explanation. That Bigfoot is not someone in our kind of immediate family. It's something very different. An ape that goes by the rather appropriate name of Gigantopithecus. Gigantopithecus was thought to have been the largest ape that ever existed. Now, when you look at recreations of this thing, it looks like exactly what you would imagine Bigfoot to be. It's a gigantic ape-type creature standing on two legs and towering over humans. And fun side note, scientists first found bits of Gigantopithecus in the mid-19th century in Asia. Its giganto teeth were being sold in drugstores as <laughs> dragon teeth. So, could Gigantopithecus really be Giganto Bigfoot? In Gigantopithecus, we have something that's the right size at the right time. But when Jeff says the right size... It's not like researchers have a full skeleton of this thing. The only representation is two jaws and a few thousand isolated teeth, which is paltry. I mean, when you oh, think about it. Oh, that's all we it, have. We don't have any, like, any, no, no legs, no arms. We have no long no bones, arms. no leg. Yeah, exactly. So we don't even know if Giganto was all that Giganto. And when Jeff says that Gigantopithecus was around in the right time... He doesn't mean we have evidence that this thing is pottering around Texas right now. In fact, the bones that we do have have been dated to a long time ago. Perhaps as recently as 200 to maybe 300,000 years ago. And that really is a long time ago. Now, either explanation that Bigfoot is an ancient human-like thing that's still around or a Gigantopithecus-like thing, they're both somewhat plausible. But for these ideas to be convincing, we need evidence that these creatures are, of course, still living today. So, are they? Well, of course, maybe it's possible that they survived after all this time. I mean, after all, so did we. But unlike humans... We don't have a body or any bones from modern times that would suggest that these creatures are still around. All that we have are some fuzzy photos and videos that people claim show Bigfoot. So, if Bigfoot's around, where is it? Well, where's the body? Okay. Well, many of these questions sort of pale when you recognize the rarity of these creatures. Jeff has thought a lot about why there is no body and no skeleton. He says, OK, so what if there's just not a lot of them around? And say they tend to hang out at night and often on their own in big forests, which would make them harder to find. Solitary, nocturnal, far-ranging... It's not that surprising that we haven't found a body. And Jeff says, OK, what if there's a small group in Idaho, like 100 Bigfoots? 
Wait, what's what's the plural of Bigfoot? Is it big feet? Okay, so say there's a hundred big feet. At most, perhaps in in all of Idaho, a hundred individuals. There's twenty thousand black bear in Idaho. Compare a a hundred potentially a hundred Bigfoot with twenty thousand black bear. Now you go out in the field. How many times do you bump into a black bear? Okay, but Jeff, of course, knows that people do sometimes bump into black bears. So, with no body, what else can we look at to see if Bigfoot is out there? Well, one thing we can look at is footprints. Remarkably, scientists can use tracks to try to understand how animals live. It's particularly useful for understanding extinct creatures like dinosaurs and even early humans. As one researcher wrote, footprints are the, quote, nearest things we have to movies of extinct animals, end quote. Footprints can give us hints about how fast a creature was travelling, whether it was an adult or a child, how tall they were, and even if they had missing toes or arthritis. And footprints are actually Jeff's specialty. But here's another thing you need to know about Jeff. Bigfoot is kind of his passion project. And since the 90s, he's amassed one of the world's largest collections of footprints attributed to Bigfoot. Well, I don't have a uh, an exact count, but it's in the neighborhood of 300 probably, 300 just casts and then files with photographs uh, of, of uh, probably hundreds more. 300. Where are they stored? Uh, in my laboratory, I've got uh, uh, drawer banks uh, that go from floor to ceiling. And these casts of Bigfoot prints have convinced Jeff that there really might be something to this Bigfoot story. He says that these Bigfoot prints are very different to humans or bears or apes. He says, for one, they're bigger. After all, they're big feet from Bigfoot. Uh, They're also much wider. Toes that are more uniform in size. Uh, In some instances, their individuals have a little more webbing between the toes, up under the toes. Jeff can remember the first time he saw what he thinks was a Bigfoot print out in the woods. It was some 20 years ago, and he went to meet a Bigfoot amateur investigator in Washington State. He says, do you want to see some fresh tracks? And I said, what do you mean? And I said, well, he said, well, I just found some this morning. I'll be happy to take you up and show you. And so I was, you know, a little incredulous, but I thought, well, what have we got to lose? Let's go take a look. So we went up and here was this remarkable line of tracks, you know, 35, 45 uh, clear footprints in the mud. If I knelt down, I could actually see skin ridge detail in some of them. They were that fresh. And How big uh, were they? They were 15 inches long. 15, 15 inches? 15 inches and about, yeah, and about five inches across the, the forefoot, uh, about four inches across the heel. Um, and like, in, and what, like, what else could explain that? Are there bears in that area? Oh, nothing. Oh, well, yes, there are, but these were not bear tracks. I mean, I, I know bear tracks, and it, it, it was it was reduced to two alternatives. They were either real or somehow he had hoaxed these. And so I ju- I just looked it up, and so in the the Guinness World Records says that the world's largest feet are pretty mm-hmm. much fifteen inches. Right. Yeah. So, so that, could that's it. When, once the man in the world with the biggest feet <laughs> could he have been walking in these woods that day? Not not very likely. Not very likely. Once you get past 12, 13 inches, you're up to less than 1% of the male human population. So while Jeff is convinced by what he says are footprint evidence, other scientists aren't. They say these footprints could just be a hoax, another animal, or just a weird pattern in the mud. And without evidence of a body, a live animal that's making those prints, it can be really tricky to know exactly what you're looking at. But the scientific search for Bigfoot is far from over. After the break, a Bigfoot bounty worth millions of dollars and a scientist fears for his life. (laughs) 
This episode of Science Versus is brought to you by The Swell. The Swell is a six-part, very timely drama series about what would happen if a catastrophic once-in-every-10,000-year storm hit Belgium and the Netherlands. In this part of the world, people are especially vulnerable to storms, and for the most part, they're protected by a system of dikes and dams that date back hundreds of years. This series imagines the fallout if a superstorm wiped out all of those defences. The Swell shows how six people struggle to return to normalcy in the storm's aftermath. All six episodes of The Swell are available on Sundance Now. For a 30-day free trial, visit sundancenow.com and use the promo code SCIENCE. That's sundancenow.com with the promo code SCIENCE. This episode of Science Versus is brought to you by WP Engine. Whether you're an entrepreneur trying to create and build a business or you're an intrapreneur in a larger company trying to innovate, your website is important. It's the first place that people go to to learn more about what you do and who you are. And your website and app can help you connect and engage with your customers and ultimately grow your business. And something has to keep that website running lightning fast. And that's WP Engine. With WP Engine's digital experience platform, you can build remarkable websites and apps on WordPress that drive your business forward faster and keep everything running smoothly. So press ahead with WP Engine. Go to WPEngine.com to get started. Welcome back. So, we've established that it's possible that some ancient human or ancient gorilla-like thing might have evolved to become Bigfoot. But we've also established that there's no body to speak of, and we can't just rely on footprints to prove that Bigfoot exists. Still, hope is not lost. We're going to meet Brian Sykes, an emeritus professor of human genetics at Oxford University, and he's been on the hunt for Bigfoot. And yes, Brian talks like he's got a pipe in his mouth. I I thought I'd have a look at that. It was worth a very long shot. It is certainly an eccentric project, unlike anything I've done before. Brian and a colleague were one of the first to sequence DNA from ancient bones. And while some of his work has been disputed, Brian's research has helped us unravel the human evolutionary tree. But back to Bigfoot. There was a time in his eccentric project when Brian felt certain that he was in danger. He was 100 miles north of Seattle, deep in the woods. What I felt a little foolish about was that I'd gone prepared for death. (laughs) I really had. And he thought he could hear Bigfoot, the creature, knocking about. I bought a GoPro so that if the creature leapt out from the cave and went for me, there would at least be some footage of the incident, even if I would end up in a bloody mess on the path. Luckily, he lived to tell the tale. And in fact, after his daring escape, he worked out that what he thought was Bigfoot noises actually might have just been a big tree branch rubbing against a tree trunk. But still, that didn't dissuade Brian. And in fact, he wasn't out in Bigfoot territory to faff about with GoPros. He wanted to use something that would prove once and for all if Bigfoot was real. DNA evidence. Because that meant... We can have an end to all these fuzzy photographs and footprints and other vague uh, indications, which uh, are quite sometimes quite amusing to listen to, but get a bit tedious after a while. Brian scoured the globe, hoping to put together the most rigorous collection of DNA attributed to Bigfoot. And he was looking for hair samples with enough genetic evidence inside them to test properly. Brian got the word out to people who might have Bigfoot hair. He put a call out to museums. And just sort of joined in with Bigfoot hunts and met the Bigfoot enthusiasts. They were very, very nice people and they were very, very helpful. In the end, Brian came up with 30 hairs that he could extract enough DNA from to identify what the devil these animals were. 
And all sorts of people gave him samples, including a man who claimed to have killed a Bigfoot and a museum that stored samples away for more than 50 years. They turned out to be really, um, well, they were quite a few bears, not surprisingly, but there were also horses and cows, I remember. There was a porcupine, there was a raccoon even. Um, What else? Quite a few wolves as well. Point is, no anomalous primates that could be Bigfoot. And Brian isn't the only study to suggest that when people thought they saw Bigfoot, they were actually looking at something else. A study analysing decades of Bigfoot sightings across the Pacific Northwest found that Bigfoot hotspots often overlapped with black bear territory, suggesting that they're, quote, maybe cases of mistaken identity, end quote. Well, of course, I I was a bit disappointed. It would have been a find of the century, really, wouldn't it? You sound very colonial, don't you? Oh, dear. (laughs) But Brian says that his research actually doesn't mean that Bigfoot doesn't exist. Would you be surprised if something were to come up? Not particularly, not too surprised. I suppose 30 hairs is really nothing. And anyone who says, oh, no, they can't possibly be, is guilty of of being unscientific. At the risk of being unscientific, I still have to ask, is it really possible? Could a large mammal be in North America in 2017 and no one has found a verified skeleton or a body? Could Bigfoot really be the world champion of hide-and-seek? We've got one more expert who just might have our answer. Dr. Disatel will analyse the Bigfoot evidence you collect in our state-of-the-art DNA lab. Yes. We're going to meet Professor Todd Disatel, who you might remember from such shows as $10 million Bigfoot Bounty. The premise? Pretty simple. If any of you can provide us with visual and DNA evidence of Sasquatch, you will win a $10 million million dollar bounty. When Todd's not on reality TV, he runs New York University's Molecular Primatology Lab. This must be it. Bigfoot crossing. Where, as part of his work, he identifies new primates and studies the origin of human species. Now, after that show he was on, where, by the way, no one got the bounty, Bigfooters are still sending Todd stuff to analyse. I get random crap in the mail constantly. I, some guy in January sent me a banana that he said he saw a Bigfoot eating and he went and got the peel and wanted me to sequence to see if there was any Bigfoot saliva on it. And Todd finds it very difficult to believe that Bigfoot is hiding in the woods somewhere. We put the idea to him that maybe there's just not that many Bigfoots around, big feet around, and Todd was pretty unimpressed. Part of the reason for this is because he says there's just all this technology out there that makes it pretty easy to find big animals, like game cameras. It's a motion detector, infrared camera that's out there at night. I mean, anytime anything walks by it, it snaps a picture. And Todd says that it's not just the odd Bigfoot hunter planting these cameras. It's scientists, naturalists and hunters. It's the thousands of people going out on weekends and then tens of thousands of game cams are out there. Now, lots of great pictures of bear asses, like (laughs) black bear, grizzly bear. But where's the the Bigfoot body? Where's the body? Where's a skeleton? Todd couldn't remember the last time a completely new species of large mammal was found in North America. So... We went searching, and one scientist told us that it was possibly a new species of sheep that was described by scientists more than a 100 years ago. But since then, we haven't had much in North America that's big and new and lives on land. There are things out there that have not been discovered, and there always will be. Um, I just am sceptical we've overlooked a eight-foot-tall, 600, 700-pound giant walking amongst us. 
the probability isn't zero, but it's adjacent to it. So when it comes to science versus Bigfoot, does it stack up? Well, we've got lots of footprints, big footprints, but they're tricky to make heads or tails of. And otherwise, we have no bones, no DNA, and no body. OK, so we at Science Versus, we're not holding our breath for any Bigfoot bodies to appear anytime soon. But that does raise the question, why are people still seeing Bigfoot all around the world? And, well, maybe it's because they keep looking for Bigfoot, wanting, hoping to see Bigfoot. And so sometimes they actually see it. That might be what's happening in Round Rock, Texas. This is one huge footprint found along the Brushy Creek Trail Father's Day weekend. More evidence keeps popping up. But there's also something you don't know yet. We followed up with the Parks and Rec media team, Roger and Mary, just to get a little more info about those sightings. The enthusiasm from our Round Rock, Texas residents has, has been so positive and exciting. We're inviting kids to come with their flashlights to actually have their own nighttime Bigfoot expedition experience. And we kind of think that they might actually get a glimpse of him Maybe. at that. <gasps> Are one of you two dressing up as Bigfoot in order to encourage kids out on the park? Is that what's going on? It definitely won't be Mary and I. No, for sure. definitely no. <laughs> oh, but it will be someone. It will be someone, yes. Guys! They've been looking for him. we got to give him something to, you know. <laughs> Whether Bigfoot's real or not, we the community is so excited and positive about this that we got to give him something to find. We yeah. don't want to let them down. But Definitely. But people believe. They really believe. And then... Well, the, I think some of the real evidence is the enthusiasm that oh, our residents have. Oh, come on! <laughs> Can you tell I work in media relations? Mm -hmm. That's science versus Bigfoot. This episode has been produced by our senior producer, Caitlin Sorry, me, Wendy Zuckerman, Rose Reed, Heather Rogers, and Shruti Ravindran. Production assistance from Rose Rimler. Edited by Blythe Terrell and Annie Rose Strasser. Fact checking by Michelle Harris. Sound design by Martin Peralta. Music written by Bobby Lord. And a big thank you to Dr. Michael J. Hickerson, as well as Professor James L. Patton. Thank you, James. He sent us a seven-page document describing the last large mammals discovered by Western scientists in North America. Suffice to say, Bigfoot wasn't on the list. Next week, Science Versus is tackling vitamins. What do you actually need to take? And will you regret it if you don't? So if you were going to explain this to your seven-year-old, he said, Daddy, should I take calcium supplements? What would you say? I, I would say, no, there'd be a complete waste of time for you. <laughs> Why do you ask? <laughs> I'm Wendy Zuckerman. Back to you next time. Hey, it's Wendy, and you're about to hear a special post-show produced in partnership with Cole Hahn, the fashion brand that believes in highlighting the stories of smart and extraordinary women. So I got in the studio with three women who I would definitely consider extraordinary. Flora Lichtman, host of Every Little Thing. Hello. Brittany Luce, host of The Nod. Nice to see you guys. And Lisa Chow, host of Startup. Hey, how's it going? We talked about something that we all deal with in different ways. Perfectionism. I'm the youngest of four, and my oldest sister, I was I would have been like crying about some homework task that like maybe I was like coloring in the lines and I like colored out of it. I just remember being so upset about this homework task. And my oldest sister was like, Wendy, not everything has to be perfect. And like it can't be perfect all the time. And I I was like, 
nah. Like, I remember <laughs> thinking, I was like, what do you mean? What are you talking about? Man, I still don't have that message. Like, I still, <laughs> I, I still haven't internalized that message. I feel like I have to, like, have a reality check when I'm doing a piece about where I want it to be. I'm, like, very self-critical and very critical of our work in this way that seems in some ways good because it's like, I want us to be the best that it can possibly be. And then in other ways feels, like, not useful. Like, you can just go down a spiral. (laughs) Like, this is never-ending. But at the end of the day, I'd much rather be striving. I can't even remember a piece where I'm like, well, that was perfect. Yeah. I, like, I don't think, any, no, like, can no. you, and that never happens, right? So it seems like you have to just be okay with that. And closing the margin between what you think is what you can do and what you're doing feels like the, the aim, for me, anyway. And that whole thing that there is no, there is no perfect. There is no perfect. Mm-mm. No, there is. Brittany what about you how do you deal with it I try to focus on like am I getting better did I do every single thing perfectly probably not but I'm like okay like my tracking this week was way better than it was last week that's a win and that's all I have time for and it's like it's over anyway it's like people listen to it it's 30 minutes I'd be really impressed if someone got something that I said tattooed on their chest, but until that happens, <laughs> Life goes. I'm going to try to keep goes. my inner perfectionist, like, just to uh, try to get this person to pop out only when I need them. Uh, yeah, I, I think that, I mean, definitely having kids has, like, put that in perspective in the sense of, you know, I really just don't actually have the mental emotional and physical bandwidth <laughs> oftentimes has that affected your work yeah well you know it's weird because i i'd also say that the most ambitious projects i've ever worked on have been in this time when i have young kids which so it's like <laughs> so it has been hard you know i think that's been really really hard um when you say the bandwidth is it is it like a mixture of oh you know these people around you and they're like we've got to we've got to make this better we've got to make this better you're like, yeah, we do. But, like, my kid just did something really cute. And I don't, like, <laughs> I wish it were my kid did something really cute. <laughs> it's more just like, you know, I'll have a morning where I wake up and, you know, the kids wake up at 6. So no matter what, they're my alarm clock. So I wake up at 6. And, you know, it's just a really tiring morning getting one of the kids ready for school. And then it's an incredibly exhausting walk to school because the kid's, like, having a temper tantrum and punching me in the neck. And so by the time you get to work, (laughs) you're just like, oh, my God, I need a nap. Um, That's, like, the physical bandwidth and the emotional bandwidth. You're just, like, physically drained and tired. So, like, when you're at work, work is a break. But it's also just, like, you know... There are times where you're just like, yeah, I, I don't care about whether I can hear that breath. You know, like there's like little yeah. things like I, mm-hmm. I read the mix notes and I'm just like, I do not care. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like I don't care if you hear that edit. I can't hear it. There's scoring underneath it. It'll be fine. Not caring about edits? Finally, a good reason to have kids. Joking. Not really joking. But seriously, it was great to chat with Brittany, Lisa and Flora. What a bunch of extraordinary women. And to hear more of our conversation produced in partnership with Cole Hahn, check out extraordinariesonthemic.com and listen to Every Little Thing, Startup and The Nod. That's extraordinariesonthemic.com to hear more of our conversation produced in partnership with Cole Hahn. Thanks to our sponsor, Sundance Now, and their series, The Swell. Follow what happens to six people as they face off against the deadliest storm to hit the Netherlands and Belgium in history. You can find it on Sundance Now. For a 30-day free trial, visit sundancenow.com and use the promo code SCIENCE. That's sundancenow.com with the promo code SCIENCE. Thanks to our sponsor, WP Engine. If you're an IT company, marketer or developer, your website is an essential part of your business. Something has to keep that website going, like an engine. And that's WP Engine. With WP Engine's digital experience platform, you can build remarkable websites and apps on WordPress that drive your business forward faster and keep everything running smoothly. Press ahead with WP Engine. Go to wpengine.com to get started.
I'm in Gemmelstad. No, I don't know where I am. In Switzerland in the Alps. Uh, yes, have you have you heard of Bigfoot? Bigfoot? Do you know do you know the monster? Ah, no. <laughs> I don't see the monster. Uh, no, no. 